Ok. Sí, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear myself. All right, good morning. Uh, we will start in a couple of minutes. Um, you might want to get a headset if you don't have one. That's uh, probably the only way you'll be able to hear uh, in this room. So we'll start in a couple of minutes. take your seats and we can start. Good morning. Welcome to the workshop on uh, internet public policy or tools for the practitioner. This is workshop number 68. It's taking place on this um, 7th of November 2011. My name is Ben Ako. Uh, I wear a number of hats coming into this conference. The first is as an academic at the university, and the second is as a civil society person working to advocate more broad-based civil society participation in internet public policy. Uh, underneath my hat as a civil society person, I work as an associate with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. At ISD, we believe that uh, we should live uh, better in the future, sustainably. That's our vision. Um, Li better living for all sustainably. Uh, our mission statement is to champion innovation, enabling societies to live sustainably. And we promote uh, this transition uh, toward a sustainable future to demonstrate how human ingenuity can be applied to improve the well-being of the environment, economy, and society. Um, and the tools that we use are usually policy research, uh, information exchange, analysis, and uh, advocacy. Um, internet governance uh, in this forum uh, as a public policy issue um, is our perception. Uh, we see uh, this as an important vehicle for us to drive, um, uh, drive towards a sustainable future. Uh, as a result, we have suggested in a publication um, at the IGF uh, two years ago in Vilnius publication with the title ICTs, the Internet, and Sustainable Development, uh, that Internet public policy better captures issues under discussion at this forum. And I've had a couple comments uh, that uh, 
from the main session yesterday that talks about the, uh, the nomenclature sur surrounding this process. Um, there were a few comments that, uh, that perhaps governance is not the right word. And I think we were beginning to hit that, hint at that um, two years ago when we said it was more about public policy than it was about governance. So um, it becomes very important when we begin to situate that discussion and the meaning of this process within a broader context of development and growth in the future. That the internet is not just about physical internet resources, the technical aspects of the internet, but how the internet impacts on our lives now and in the future. And then we suggested in that publication that the public policy, sh that public policy should seek to gather evidence from stakeholders um, and consent because the policies that result would affect them. Equally important are those stakeholders who should be involved in the dialogue and the process, but choose not to do so. And so whatever policy it is that we'll all talk about should consider people that may willingly decide not to participate in the process. A and so the IGF's current uh, uh, theme is of grave importance, uh, particularly because it's about sustainable uh, human, economic, and social development. And so we find ourselves situated in that uh, context today, and, and that's why this forum is quite important. For us, we see that there is an opportunity for the Internet to be dialogued in a truly multi-stakeholder fashion, one that involves different stakeholders from different backgrounds with various interests and stakes in how the Internet affects them now and in the future. The internet is not just about its influences today, it's about its impacts today and tomorrow. It's about its influences for future generations, for those of our kids and their kids' kids. I was utterly fascinated yesterday, sitting in a room with 14 to 17 year olds, um, this room actually, yesterday, uh, who were talking about the internet and its present and future impact on their lives. Um, for instance, how it helps them to do their homework, and how it has become an integral part of their being and of their existence. These young people realize that they stay connected even when they are offline. That was a statement that caught my, my interest. Why, even while they were online, they stay connected. Um, and they're begin beginning to realize that. That there is a shifting culture and perception of the role of the internet to this particular demographic. It is no longer a tool to do homework, but one that defines who they are, their identity, if you want to you know, be more specific. By the end of the day, they were debating the role of the Internet in creating what they called new citizenship. Um, so it's no longer about uh, uh, me as a gained student. One of the, stu one of the participants said, a 14-year-old, um, that gained uh, students his age in his country think about themselves first as a global citizen before they consider themselves as uh, Danish citizens. So the culture, the, 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 the perception of citizenship is changing from this particular demographic. And if we situate these people into the future of the internet that we have been talking about here, we begin to see how critical the discourse that we're having in this room is. These stories show how important the Internet is to the people. The Internet is about people connected. It's integral to pre present and future societies. These are the concerns that enable us to engage with stakeholders in both uh, developed and developing countries, to enable a public policy platform that responds to uh, uh, accommodate various stakeholders and voices, to produce evidence and consent, to encourage citizens to directly involve in fashioning policies that concern their present and future sustainable development. In the past years, we've talked of these lessons um, um, in a text which we have right now, um, and, and that's the text uh, right here. Um, it's called uh, Toolkit on Internet Public Policy Tools for the Practitioner. So if you're leaving today, you might want to grab a copy of these or one or two folks in your IGF or your local context. Um, what we've done is, from my experience, uh, facilitating and interacting with uh, stakeholders and forums in developing and developed country context, we uh, took out what we termed were the lessons that we learned from the process and tried in ways to simplify them in tools that, is e that are easily 
understood by policy practitioners, people like you and I who would want to start or catalyze a policy process in our country. Um, and here on the table with me, uh, on the panel this morning, are people that have done uh, or are policy practitioners in their specific areas, our country councillors, people that have been involved in the policy process. Um, and we want, we would like to learn with them and learn from them what their experiences are, have been, um, given some of the tools that have been described here, and uh, perhaps learn a few more of the tools that you know they are aware of that we are not aware of, and see how together we can globally begin to build a collective of tools that allow us to facilitate processes in our countries that achieve results. One of the principles talked about in the, in the toolkit is that of subsidiarity. We do recognize that you could have policy dialogue at a global level, but what, where the impact happens or where impact is recognized is at the local level. And at the local level is where we can actually effect change. And so even though the IGF in a global scope allows us to understand and to learn lessons and to share experiences from rich people from other countries, we actually have to go back home and define specific things and objectives that we would like to achieve. So together this uh, morning in this room, we have an interesting panel that would help us think about some of the key questions on facilitating processes, making them effective, what such as examples of policies that they have identified in their countries um, have looked at and um, took taken specific steps in trying to address. So find uh, from my right is Andrew. Um, Andrew from the Pacific IGF. Uh, right next to her is uh, Abdullah Kamara. Abdullah Kamara is from Liberia. Uh, Liberia is a West African country, and he's been facilitating that process the last couple of years. Kowela uh, Nyerenda is from uh, South African IGF. Um, sorry? The Southern African IGF. I need to correct that. So that's a regional IGF, I believe, right? Um, and uh, the Southern African IGF comprises of countries in the Chadak region. Um, to my left, immediate left, is Nengna Wakama, uh, who is um, coordinating the West African IGF. Um, and then right next to her, we have Mark Cavell. Mark is uh, a part and parcel of the UK IGF. Um, and to the far uh, left is Charles Bowie who is from the Sierra Leonean IGF. So you could see that we have a mix of uh, people from developing countries, uh, developed countries, tools that have worked for them, have not worked for them, um, you know, a wide variety, a good mix of male and female. So we have fulfilled the, the requirements of this workshop in terms of balance. Uh, but in terms of uh, the discussions, I believe that there's a lot more that they will have to say that we would uh, catch at the end of the workshop against our own experiences. So I'm going to start from, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to start from Koela. Koela, please describe for us, uh, in, in just ver very briefly, what what Take Your IGF is. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll pass it on to Mark after that. So I think just to put things in context, I want to say that um, the agency that I come from, which is the NEPAL agency, which is the technical agency of the African Union, is an intergovernmental agency that basically works on development projects um, on the continent. Um, specifically, my program, which is the EFSA program, looks at IGP um, issues. Now, in terms of the Southern African IGF, we took an interest in terms of facilitating that process because we noticed that when we look at the continent, all the other regions have those structural goals, where Southern Africa did not seem to have the focus goals. And um, based on our analysis, very simple analysis of how the other IGFs have been structured and how they have been developed, um, we took an approach that said, let's start with the regional um, effort first to kind of raise awareness and build awareness but also being cognizant of the fact that um, within, the, within the African Union, the regional economic communities have a significant role to play, especially in terms of you know, its policies, uh, you know, its guidance principles and everything. 
that is basically in place that says rather than having international processes, let's start with the regional process first, raise awareness, and then use that as a platform to then make um, national processes. So we partnered um, with APC, um, which is a global uh, organization, and we also partnered with Sangonet, which is a Southern African NGO network, which does a really significant job of translation. And we took that approach again because we wanted to make sure that as we are building this, we are actually following a similar Africa Goes approach. Um, so with that partnership with um, uh, APC and Sangonet, we then approached South Africa and we brought in uh, South African players and we also did some work in South Africa. Um, the inaugural forum was held last year in Beijing, Russia, and um, it, it was well attended beyond our expectations because we really started that ethos and we then took it and we discovered it would take us half a year to get to that point. But we ended up with uh, 120 people um, and representing all of the started with uh, um, two countries and now we're 58. And from that, um, we, you know, we basically took an approach where we looked at the issues that were going to be tabled as the global IGF and we commissioned background papers on each of those issues, which were then circulated to all the participants beforehand. This way it, it, it all comes then into having an idea of what exactly it was that we were trying to accomplish as such, but also more importantly, we signaled um, to participants that the idea here was to begin a conversation, begin a dialogue, begin a process, and then see how we could actually move uh, that process forward. Um, I think one of the things that, uh, for me, that came out of that meeting that was, I think, very a very good start is that at the end of the meeting, we were able to have a community that actually listed all the issues that people felt were very important to them as far as the various uh, thematic issues within the international development space. And then they also brought out other areas which they felt perhaps were not as highly, um, that, that they didn't think were being significantly captured uh, within the IGF scheme. So we did start with one fluid sort of vulnerable people, and then there was also another one on capacity building where they talked about leadership partnerships within the next summer. So really the idea for us was to raise awareness, was to begin a dialogue, begin a process, and then see from there how we take that process forward and translate it uh, to a national level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, <coughs> you mentioned um, my role with regard to the UK Internet Governance Forum. I'm, I'm from the UK government. Uh, I'm also um, active with regard to the Commonwealth and the Com Commonwealth Internet Governance Forum, and also there's a European um, Internet Governance Forum called Eurobridge, which we uh, contribute to as well. So I'm, I'm sort of involved in sort of various levels um, at national and um, uh, uh, regional for Europe and also the Commonwealth, which is, which is global for the, for, the, for the Commonwealth member states as well as here, of course, um, with the UN uh, Global Process. Um, but I'll, I'll just focus, I think, on, on the UK IGF um, and explain really that this goes back some way. Um, it, it was born out of the WCIS uh, negotiations where we had already been engaging with stakeholders in, in developing our positions as the UK in the WSIS negotiations. So we had a process of engagement with stakeholders from business and, uh, and civil society as well, and also um, within government and with parliament. So we had this kind of approach that we, we, we needed to engage, hear what people say, and, uh, and be accessible um, you know, so that stakeholders would feel they could, they could contact us and say what we were doing was well and what we were not getting quite right. So it was a very important to have that iterative uh, process. And this followed through once um, uh, the IGF at the global level was established. And then we thought, well, we better start sort of preparing for the global IGF. Uh, what, how do we do that? So um, we used that 
network you have of, of contacts in business and civil society, and we talked to parliamentarians uh, about, uh, about this, and we decided to construct a national forum, and, and UK, uh, I think, was the first to do that. The, uh, the French government also initiated the process roughly about that time, so they may argue they were first, but uh, I think we would say that we were first. And as I say, the idea was, well, let's, let's prepare um, our ground, really, for the Global Internet Governance Forum and, and find out, well, what are the issues that are of concern to, to stakeholders uh, in the UK? So we started to build up a network. Um, it was a very kind of organic process of building on, on the network of, of contacts. And, and uh, we then thought, well, let's... let's um actually hold an event, a UK IGF event, and we started to work very closely with Nominet, the .uk registry, and uh, they have a trust fund and enabled them to finance uh, the holding of uh, IGFs uh, for us, for the UK. We work closely with them, our ministers get involved, and we, we, we help promote awareness of it. Um, so we've done that ever since, since uh, 2007. Um, and uh, basically it involves two concrete open meetings a year. The first one um, will follow, uh, if we look ahead, the, the next one will follow this um, IGF in Baku. We'll get all the stakeholders from the UK together, those who weren't here, those who were here, let's uh, discuss what happened here and, and um, um, get a kind of sense of what was important for, for the UK and for Europe um, in, in the course of our sort of policy interaction across Europe is very important too. Um, and, um, you know, pick up on what really we might then take forward, what might actually have resonance for, for national policy, what might then also be important for us to develop in anticipation of the next IGF, global IGF. And the second meeting, uh, which will be held probably in the spring sometime, will then anticipate the next IGF in, in Bali. It'll, it'll provide focused discussion, sort of workshop, parallel workshop kind of discussion about uh, key issues that are coming through from stakeholders in the UK as to what we would like to develop at the next IGF. Um, and um, we then uh, take forward from that concrete proposals to submit to the, to the, to the IGF Secretariat in terms of workshops and so on. So it's a very um, interactive process, a very inclusive one. We have a lot of parliamentarian support. We've got two MPs actually here in, in Baku um, who are not members of the government, but they're members of parliament, representing uh, citizens' interests and, and uh, with, with uh, they have specialist knowledge as well to bring to this, this forum. So it's a very iterative process, and it's very important for us both in sort of disseminating from the global IGF, uh, you know, ideas, issues, new emerging issues, uh, best practice, technical developments, opportunities for cooperation that we're going to hear about here in, in Baku. So that, that firstly, and then secondly, to anticipate um, uh, the next uh, uh, IGF and, and the range of discussions uh, that will take place there. So that's basically how the status of it and how we work. I thank hope that's Thanks a lot, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, I, I did particularly like your description of your process of how you fed from your national uh, to, your to the global and that the issues are not solely disconnected. I mean, it's a clear process that is defined, and that's a, a fascinating point. Uh, Nina, um, could you talk to us a little about uh, two situations here, the, the, the national uh, Cote d'Ivoire situation, um, and maybe just talk about uh, the West African regional uh, context as well. And perhaps you might want to share with the African, uh, about the African process a little bit too, because um, it, it would then fit quite clearly with what Mark had talked about, the transition of the various processes from one region, one feeding to the other. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, first, about myself. Um, I'm the Deputy Chief Ecology Commissioner of Trade and Economic Research Project. Um, Ecology is a work in itself. It runs into the Digital Solidarity Fund 
Thanks, Amanda. Um, Andrew, do you want to come in now? Right. Yes? Okay. So, 
Good morning to everyone. Uh, before I explain the ro my role, Anju and I work for the Secretariat of the Pacific Community, and uh, we work with the uh, we work and provide technical assistance to uh, the 22 countries, and uh, in the role of land resources, maritime, uh, marine resources, social resources, which is gender, youth activities, and also um, ICT outreach programs. And but we're trying to um, link it to all the other sectors like agriculture, education and uh, health. Um, just briefly, the Pacific Institute of Public Policy is the, actually it's the leading independent um, uh, uh, think tank for the, uh, for the Pacific and uh, they sort of work on a multi-stakeholder um, network trying to encourage uh, policy stakeholders in uh, engaging them in, in research work, in communications, and it's a, it's a process that that applies to information being shared um, using innovative or people-centered ideas. Huh? In 2005, a Pacific Islands ICT policy and plan was developed and the Pacific Plan Digital Strategy, uh, which was done in 2006, was endorsed by our forum ICT ministers. So the forum ICT ministers include the Pacific countries. And uh, then the regional framework for action on ICT for development in the Pacific. Uh, outlined, uh, which was quite long, so, but I'm happy to provide you with the um, information. Um, I agree with Ben, what you meant, uh, what you said about governance is not, um, not the right word. In relation to um, looking at the critical resources that we work on, um, I guess it affects everyone, not just uh, policy makers, not just ministers, it, will, uh, it affects also to the grassroots people. And that's, that's the one thing that we're trying to do is work with the grassroots in, and the communities and, um, and trying to encourage the use of ICTs in agriculture, health sector, and education. Um, Diplo Foundation, um, they were in collaboration with S SPC, organized a internet governance forum for the stakeholders in Fiji and Cook Islands. And what we did was, the, it was a two week workshop that first we targeted uh, the ministers, the diplomats from and high level CEOs uh, of mobile companies, of ISP providers and other, um, dip, uh, other diplomats and senior uh, position uh, delegates. And then the second week targeted users from the public and uh, policy uh, information professionals that were in charge of maintaining like uh, network server administ they were server administrators, they were ICT professionals, information professionals, um, and, uh, and some of the policy makers. So based on the Fiji and Cook Islands Forum, we, we realized that there was a need to have a Pacific IGF, uh, um, uh, Pacific IGF Forum. So the Secretariat of the Pacific Community, in collaboration with uh, partner organizations like Internet New Zealand, ISOC, um, d uh, organized the Pacific IGF in New Caledonia. This was in 2010. And a follow-up conference will be organized, which will be in two, two weeks from 20 22nd to 26th November in Fiji. Um, the transition of the process uh, started from a national framework and then uh, we looked at the regional framework, but working in collaboration with the national uh, counterparts, mainly with the national stakeholders and not only the, um, the users, but also the policy makers and also trying to loop in the ICT um, policy um, officers. Um, from my point of view, it's a personal uh, uh, point of view <laughs> perspective, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, one issue that we faced was that no, not all the sectors were part of the policy process. So uh, an ICT policy was developed, but the agriculture, the health sector, the um, forestry and um, other sector sectors were not involved in the policy process. And this is one of the issues that we face, 
that it's usually top level and it stays there, but it does not trickle down to the users. And some of the workshops that we do, we try to encourage, okay, this is the policy that we've been working on and this is what the public commission has uh, um, uh, has uh, circulated to the, to the national counterparts. Are you aware of it? Some of them say they're not aware of it. And so this is something that we are trying, it's a challenge for us and we are trying to work on this. Thanks, Thank Angie. You. Appreciate it. Um, I'd like you want to tell us about uh, your process in Sierra Leone briefly, please. Thank you. So, Liberia. Yeah, pr sorry, from Liberia. Thank you so much. Uh, I think Nina has been very right in saying that uh, the process in Liberia is uh, in the fore. Uh, there have been some government participation, but have been pretty limited. Uh, but like you say, the multi-stakeholder process has been very effective. You know, it has actually helped to to groom interest. Uh, personally, I participated in the wishes process, and uh, right after there, it was that how do we move this forward? And we needed to engage a lot of stakeholders from different sides. Uh, conference with the government ministry of telecommunication. That was before we got into uh, a telecommunication authority status. They expressed a lot of interest and was always involved with uh, whatever efforts we were putting up. As a result, when we discussed the issue of developing the policy for ICTs in Liberia, uh, our groupings were invited a lot. We were engaged with them. But now coming to the IGS being set up, we again engaged the government aspect. This is a universal process. In every in the West African region, there is a West African IGF being set up, and uh, we've been invited to help to coordinate it. So, but we need to get the support of every sector. Uh, with regards to the tooltip being used, um, firstly, there was a need for dialogue among different groupings. We engaged government, civil society, media, uh, and the corporate organizations, uh, and they expressed a lot of interest. It was a lot of slow because we had this email list and tried to get a personal meet, a face-to-face -face meeting, which was not very fast. But uh, suddenly, I realized that most of the people who were in this discussion were using other social media, like they were running Facebook. And uh, when we set up a Facebook page, it became very active, a lot more effective. More people were engaged. Even the people at the highest level of the regulatory body were involved with it. And we think that has been very effective. But uh, one point that we like to note is that uh, the policy does not succeed altogether when it's only civil society. It has to be multi-stakeholder because it's government that will finally come down with laws. So the challenge now is to get the government to participate a lot more. I know uh, two, two, three years ago at the West African Internet Governance Forum, uh, the forum with the support of Osiwa was agreeing to support a government delegation. But it took a very long time to get the government to designate a relevant person to participate. And uh, we kept engaging and look, yeah, it's not about supporting you, but it's about getting you to understand, getting the right people to come and pa attend this meeting. And uh, it improves your perspective about how we will move this uh, process forward. And once you get that, we will look down to you supporting. Um, but the good news I have is that lately, for other purposes, I've had to engage uh, people from some of the major telecom. And they say, oh, but you've been communicating with us over the years. I said, but we've been doing that. And it's, it's now time that you, since you know me from other perspectives, we need to work it. But uh, I don't like it to look like me. It's not about me. It's not about the organization we run. It's about all of us doing it together because that's the best way it works. But for the meantime, civil society and uh, media are in the forefront of internet governance issues in Liberia. And for me, that's pretty important because the media provides an opportunity of more people hearing it. Thank you. Thank you, Abluai. Oh, that's, uh, that's quite amazing. I, I've worked in, uh, in Liberia for a, for a while, and I know how vibrant the media could be and uh, what role it plays in uh, either galvanizing that society or tearing it apart. Um, and so if the media is involved in a, in a participatory process such as um, an internet public forum, it's, 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 
it's laudable um, and quite uh, an impressive uh, move that you have uh, been involved in. Thank you, Abdullahi. Uh, Sa, you, you want to talk uh, to us briefly about the Sierra Leonean process? Um, um, good morning. Um, the Sierra Leonean IGF, we have held um, two um, workshops. The first one in 2010. Um, in this workshop, we are able to engage um, the government um, represented by the ministry, the Minister of Information and Communication. Um, in 2011, also, we are able to engage the government also and bring them to, to the workshop, which brought us a, a success. Um, during the 2011 workshop, we are able to create a community that we presented to the Vice President Office, because the Vice President Office is in charge of an um, ICT in Sierra Leone, um, which led which um, led us to bring him to the um, WIGF. Uh, I think since the creation of West African IGF, Sierra Leone has presented the high delegation of government representatives in West Africa. Uh, the process is, o is still ongoing because uh, our, our online discussion list is still working, people are participating, and people are looking forward for, to for us to take the IGF because they are saying Freetown is not just Sierra Leone. They are expecting us to go out of Freetown. Like uh, since uh, 2013, we are expected to do our na uh, national IGF in the second city of Bull because people have been requesting that Sierra Leone um, is not just Freetown. So we are moving there um, next year. So our, uh, our IGF was successful with government participation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're clearly beginning to see a message of where government plays a role in, in, in this. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, I'd like to take the discussion a little forward and then we'll invite you um, on the floor to engage in the discussion as well. This, this workshop is about uh, the tools that have been used that work, the lessons that we learned in using those tools and um, how we can better engage um, in the use of a number of these tools to advance policy in our countries and regions. So a specific question to all our panelists, and this is very, uh, I mean just take a, a minute or a few maximum to try and address what specific local, what specific local policies have you sought to influence? Right, one, I, I at least one in your region that you could talk about. Uh, and, and what tils, uh, tools did you employ to achieve this? Uh, let me start with Angie. Uh, do you want to talk about that? And we we'll just run up the uh, the table like that. To be honest, I haven't gone through this toolkit, but um, some of the things that we did was during uh, the national process. We, like I said, we all it involves not only the um, higher level ministers but also the users, and 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 this is the process that we use. And like you said, that we use also the media. And this is very effective in relation to bringing awareness. For example, one of the things that we had was the broadband, broadband policy. And they asked uh, the general public to give some views on the issue of broadband policy and on the tools that were, that and the tools and the applications that we, are that we are using. But not many people understood the word broadband. I mean, from a general perspective, a community <laughs> does not understand unless you explain it to them. And so this is something that we try to emphasize to during the national process that when you go out to the community, you also need to have some awareness campaign before you actually ask them to submit uh, 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 something on re in relation to the broadband policy. So um, that's one of the things that we use. Thank you. Adelaide? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the one specific policy that uh, We've been working on uh, that was that altogether based on internet governance, but uh, it provided a lot of benefits for the internet usage of being an access to information policy in Liberia. Uh, we've been leading it, but the fact that you are seen as the face of internet governance issue and you are also seen as the face of access to information, there has always been an intrinsic li link, and uh, that has that was uh, a truly multi-stakeholder approach. Now, why uh, this grew up mainly from a media perspective, uh, there was this argument about what do we need to do reconstruction in Liberia after years of war? And uh, there are reconstruction discussion everywhere. Then uh, 
the media discussion shows that look, we need to reconstruct the media and uh, develop a, uh, an appropriate operating environment. And uh, one of the issues that came there was access to information. But then we realized that access to information was very wide. It considered internet issues, it considered issue of transparency and accountability in community, it considered uh, basic freedom. And then we led it from a media perspective and overall a uh, civil society perspective. And we real uh, before you got to know, uh, every sector of the community have embraced it. And so the owners were on the government to approve it. Uh, I speak to as I speak to you, uh, in Liberia, we had the first access to information law in West Africa. And uh, we're trying to make good of it so that uh, other countries will adapt it as well. Thanks, Adelai. Joella. Okay. So again, speaking from the perspective of uh, an intergovernmental, but also the fact that our focus is more continental, um, I think in terms of policies, the things that we have been trying to look at are really things to do with cross-border networking, um, because we see that that's something that um, is an issue in terms of um, the development of the Internet um, in Africa, but also in terms of um, people's access. Um, to the internet as well as to other infrastructure as well. So we've been working mostly looking at how do we actually create an enabling environment that allows for cross-border networking and cross-border networking. Um, the other thing that we've been also looking at in terms of trying to influence policies um, in terms of the mobile um, connectivity is looking at issues of home and away roaming because we recognize also that Mobility is an is an, an important aspect um, as far as mobile um, usage is concerned, and so we've been working um, primarily now very specifically in the SADC region, but we hope to take that um, across the continent as well. Looking at how we can actually um, get home and away roaming that's affordable um, for the continent. We've also been working together with the African Union Commission and UNEFA on a cyber security um, framework um, for the continent, um, and then. More recently, we are looking now at issues of local content and localization of content. Um, and, and one way that we're looking at doing this is through um, the Dot Africa initiative that um, is being spearheaded through the African Union.
prayer to the on the ground.
something that is more useful, feel free to talk to us about it. Um, I, I, would it be a point? Also wanted to uh, understand what it would be could. almost immediately and there will be no downtime downtime
Africa, we started off with a small workshop, having great success on the policy level, but bringing government, civil society, and private sector together. Right. Thank you very much, Ori. Um, well, thank you so much for being a wonderful participant, and I would like to thank our um, uh, panelists uh, for being wonderful participants as well. Um, we also would like to thank our sponsors that helped us with the toolkit, the IDRC, and the Open Society Initiative for West Africa for the printing of the toolkit and for facilitating the participation of our uh, participants from uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone. And most especially, would like to thank you for sitting through the session. It might have, it may have been boring from the beginning, but I think that there was a lot that we have shared today, and um, it's very important that we go back home with tangible lessons and experiences from other countries that we could apply in our own regions. Well, thank you very much for being such an engaging and a listening audience. Thanks. <laughs>